Thank you, leaders and uh, heads of delegations, the Pacific uh, Political Ocean Champion, the Pacific Islands Forum Secretary General and uh, Pacific Ocean Commissioner, Secretaries, uh, Secretaries General of the Commonwealth and the Organization of Africa, Caribbean and uh, Pacific States, the UN Secretary General Special Envoy on uh, Ocean, uh, the General Secretary of the Pacific Conference of Churches, uh, Madam Secretary of the Commonwealth, Ms. Bulavinaka. Bulavinaka, and greetings to you all. Your Excellencies, it is an indeed an honor to be here for this event, our ocean, uh, ocean manner to one blue Pacific. As this is our first gathering in Glasgow, I'm very pleased to see you all today as we join forces towards a successful COP26. We are here because uh, we all agree on one thing, that our planet is in grave danger. It is no longer business as usual, and we must uh, accelerate all efforts to restore our planet's health as the wrath of climate change intensifies. The alarm bells have been sounded loudly and this time more deafening than ever. This is the new normal right throughout our globe, from sea level rise, flash flooding, cyclones, storm surges, to droughts and bushfires. If we continue with our current actions or inaction, we will send our blue planet a global canoe sinking into the abyss. This uh, unprecedented times calls for unprecedented solutions. And as large oceanic sovereign states of the Blue Pacific, we look no further than to our endowment, our lifeblood, our ocean, for these innovative solutions. Ladies and gentlemen, Your Excellencies, we have just witnessed one such unprecedented solution. The leaders', leaders declaration on preserving maritime zones in the face of climate change related sea level rise. I am proud to have presented you, presented to you the united appeal and call from the leaders of the Blue Pacific to save our low-lying coastal developing states in our entire world from climate change related sea level rise. Indeed, sea level rise is a defining issue that uh, imperils the livelihoods and well-being of our peoples and undermines the realization of a peaceful, secure, and sustainable future for our region and for our world. The recent IPCC report underlines continued uh, sea level rise in coastal areas throughout the 21st century, contributing to more frequent and severe coastal flooding in low-lying areas and coastal erosion. Extreme sea level events that previously occurred once in 100 years could happen every year by the end of this century. Changes to the ocean, including warming, more frequent maritime uh, marine heat waves, ocean acidification, and reduced oxygen levels have been clearly linked to human influence. These changes affect both ocean ecosystems and the people that rely on them. Nations like Kiribati, the Tuvalu, and the Republic of Marshall Islands are at the front line of this global crisis with the uh, rising sea eating away our shorelines, leaving our homes and people exposed to the ruthless onslaught of coastal erosion and saltwater intrusion. In Fiji, we have relocated villages from Bundongoloa, Narikoso, and four others, which are no longer viable for human habitation. Climate-driven displacement isn't a doomsday proposition. It is happening now across our blue Pacific, and I shudder to think of what the future of my grandchildren 
and your grandchildren will be like if you continue down this path. Excellencies and friends, the declaration is not just another sheet of paper. Every word, as pronounced by our leaders tonight, carries the voices of our people, our children, our plight, and our fight to save our people and our home from this crisis. We do so by upholding the primacy of international law, the 1982 UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, as a global legal framework within which all activities in the oceans and seas must be carried out. The Declaration is our good faith interpretation of the 1982 UNCLOS on an issue that is critical to all of us. And our call to the world, ladies and gentlemen, Your Excellencies, the ocean is central to us. It is our geography, our culture, and our economy. It is at the heart of the existence of our existence and we see no solutions without it. As a public regional good, the health and resilience of the oceans features very heavily in the development of the 2050 strategy for the Blue Pacific continent. As such, and in line with our 2021 ocean statement, <coughs> excuse me, we call for urgent action to reduce and prevent the irreversible impacts of climate change on our ocean. We also call for the integration of oceans into the UNFCCC. To all our friends across the globe, we share with you a very simple but a consequential message. While it is true that climate change induced sea level rise has the potential to impact the lives of our Blue Pacific continent citizens in a very dramatic way, this phenomenon is not by any stretch of the imagination peculiar to the Blue Pacific region. In effect, many countries in the different sub-regions of the globe do stand to be similarly affected. And as such, it is in all our collective interest to build strong partnerships in our search for scalable solutions. To that end, Your Excellencies, and as a first and major step forward, I take this opportunity to extend to all of you an invitation on behalf of Pacific Islands Forum leaders and all citizens of the Blue Pacific continent. Join us under the banner of the Declaration on Preserving Maritime Zones in the Face of Climate Change-Related Sea Level Rise to lead the work to protect the future of our peoples. Let us build stronger partnerships to better take this work forward. Join us, join us, and let us all be leaders for our oceans. Thank you, Minagoyle, and God bless you all. After three COPs and almost four, and many long days and nights of negotiations, the ocean pathway is charting its course from aspiration to action. Our next big leap begins by spelling out a clear, bold, and blue vision of where the ocean pathway must lead. As some of the world's largest ocean states and as nations on the front line of climate change, we in the Pacific hope that our vision of a sustainable regional blue economy can become that of the world's, as highlighted by the Honourable Prime Minister. One glimpse of the colour of life in our island's maritime ecosystems, including our reefs, is all it takes to know exactly why they're worth fighting for. We are marrying traditional knowledge with emerging science and practice to preserve these ecosystems so that our children and grandchildren can experience them for themselves. Our challenges are great, from surging sea temperatures, ocean acidification, saltwater intrusion, stronger cyclones and tidal surges, the change is visceral and indeed intense. While we know that well-managed reefs are more resilient reefs, there is no substitute for cutting emissions. That is why it is critically important that we keep the 1.5 degree alive in Glasgow. Ocean solutions without emission reduction solutions 
amount to blue washing because there will be no reefs in our region to manage past two degrees of warming. There is also no excuse for gaps in the climate financing pledged and required to protect the most vulnerable nations. All Pacific Island nations are grappling with the impact of climate change, but none as acutely as our brothers and sisters in the smallest and lowest lying island nations. We must continue to band together to address the threat and find practical solutions. Through innovation, there is much more that can be achieved and powered through our blue economy, from offshore renewable energy to low carbon shipping solutions to protecting and restoring coastal blue carbon ecosystems. The ocean can supply at least 20% of the emissions reductions necessary to limit warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Fiji, for example, is committed to reduce domestic maritime shipping emissions by 40% by 2030 through our enhanced NDC submitted late last year. Our ability and capacity to do so will be supported in part through the reasonably led Pacific Blue Shipping Partnership Initiative. As the ocean warms, it changes. Major fish stocks like tuna are leaving our waters. We need to better understand the potential of aquaculture and establish holistic methods for protecting and restoring coastal environments. We need to recognize and account for the services we receive from mangroves and seagrass beds and invest programmatically and pra practically in the resilience of coastal communities. As we press our case at COP26 to secure climate finance for climate vulnerable countries, this is our chance to press the case for dedicated ocean financing as well. Fiji, for example, has grounded our blue emission in new policy and a world-leading legal framework, our National Ocean Policy and Climate Change Act, to support our mission to sustainably manage 1.3 million square kilometers of ocean. We have committed to designating 30% of our maritime zone as marine protected areas by 2030. And we are working to help finance that ambition through the issuance of our first blue bond, something we hope, as the Honorable Prime Minister said, can be scaled up in the region. So to sum it up, our Pacific vision is a blue Pacific ocean that produces renewable energy rather than pays for the consequences of carbon-based power. Seas that are chartered by carbon-neutral vessels. Reefs that are kept from becoming bleached and lifeless. A blue economy that is food secure and that has export potential. And coastlines that are sheltered from king tides and sea level rise. And we want the sustainable ocean management of our great blue Pacific wall to extend onwards to the mangrove fields of Bangladesh, to the beaches of Italy, to the rivers of the Americas, or to the reefs beneath the Red Sea. As with the pandemic, our fate is shared and our action must be collective. As the Pacific High Level Champion on Oceans, we look forward to working with all of you to keep oceans at the heart of our climate action effort so that it can remain as the beating heart of our lives, our livelihoods, and identity in the Pacific. Minakwa Kalebu, and thank you very much. Warm Pacific greetings to you all. Despite this chilly Glasgow evening, the presence of many familiar faces from our home region brings us all a sense of warmth, especially as we remember our shared purpose and journey here today and over the next week. With this in mind, it is my incredible honour to welcome you all to this auspicious Mono Blue Pacific Ocean Continent event. This evening is one for the history books, particularly because we will, together, formally launch the Declaration on the Preservation of Maritime Zones in the face of climate-induced sea level rise. It is, as you all know, a trailblazing declaration for our region and for the whole world. This document cements, yet again, the Pacific's global leadership in ocean governance. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the climate ocean nexus and the health of the ocean 
is so critical to life on this blue planet. It is critical to our future not only as a Pacific people, but indeed all of humankind. Our existence as communities and societies in the next century and beyond. And it's also critical for our very livelihoods now. There is no better time than the present to act and address the declining health of our ocean. The science has been very clear. We're all glaringly aware of the potential impacts on the ocean if we do not act on climate change now. Not tomorrow, not in 10 years time, but right now. You might well ask, well, what can we do? Excellencies, many of our partners, including the Commonwealth, the African and Caribbean regions, have all started to address the issues and key linkages between climate change, the ocean, and sustaining life on our planet. For the Pacific, the ocean and our livelihoods, our well-being, our prosperity and security are inextricably linked. For us, the implications of rising sea levels are a real and imminent threat. Recognizing this, our leaders have committed to accelerating the finalization of their maritime boundaries and endorsed the landmark declaration on the preservation of maritime zones in the face of climate-induced sea level rise. Friends, is it, it is our hope that our partners and other regional organizations will join with us as we look to promote and advocate this new declaration in order to influence international law to recognize our maritime boundaries into perpetuity. In this vein, we must maintain a collective stance and collective stewardship of ocean issues, not only at home, but particularly in global ocean events. There are upcoming opportunities in our Blue Pacific region, including the Palo Our Ocean Conference in mid-February next year and the Pacific Ocean Alliance meeting scheduled for early February. In addition, the second UN Ocean Conference in June in Portugal will be a critical opportunity where the Pacific will need to work together, including with our partners here today, to elevate our collective ocean interests together and get real traction on our ocean priorities. The alarm bells have been sounded. Now the hard work must begin. We need to realize and operationalize the political statements that have been made here in Glasgow. And the onus now lies with all of us to ensure that these are not mere political statements, but realize plans that will guide our next steps. Finally, I wish to reiterate the famous Pacific analogy and say that the ocean climate canoe has already set sail. We invite you all here in Glasgow to recognize and join this VACA with us and together let us chart its next course. This will be a journey where everyone here, you and I, are together on the same canoe. The winds may not always be in our favor, but we know where we're going in our quest for our collective future of our one blue global ocean and ultimately our one blue planet. This week, we all must realize that if we not, do not succeed here at COP26 in gaining real tangible actions, targets and commitments, we will have failed. My friend Ambassador Peter Thompson was wearing a badge of honor around his neck yesterday and tonight, which says, never give up. I want to end on that note. We will never give up. We cannot give up. Today has been a fantastic day for me here at COP. 
because I met and shared lunch with our young climate champions and activists from the Pacific. We all heard Brianna Fruin deliver her powerful and moving speech last Monday. They are here because they care about their future. Friends, we must save our ocean. For in saving our ocean, we are saving ourselves and our children. With such a choice before us, we simply cannot fail. We must not fail. I thank you. What an honour it is to be here amongst you all, fighting for our region. Uh, as the young people said, our leaders have been fighting this fight for a long time. We have been at the front line of SDG 14, the creation of. We've been at the front line of every COP uh, on climate change. I mean, the, the Pacific has led the way. And uh, I think I can say that not as uh, uh, taking any credit for that myself, but looking at what our leaders have done. And you look back, uh, Prime Minister, over the last 10 years, and that's an amazing legacy that uh, this generation of leaders has left. Well, first of all, I'd say that. Secondly, I would say that uh, as um, uh, the uh, Deputy Prime Minister had said, uh, the ocean is in trouble, and I think you all know about that. You all know, of course, about the climate change, but the ocean's decline in health is a measurable thing. It's measurable, and uh, you know, as, 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 as our mother, we're watching our mother dying, and uh, this is not sort of hyperbole, whether you're looking at fishing, or whether you're looking at pollution, or whether you're looking at habitat destruction, or whether you're looking at the effects of our GHG emissions, which is acidification and deoxygenation and warming with its effects on coral and uh, sea level rise. These are all measurable things, scientifically measurable, and they're happening in front of us. And you know, we stand for our children, as the Prime Minister said. I'm looking up there, I see uh, Chris Taufotofu from Tonga, he's wearing a thing like me, saying, we're re here to represent our children, our grandchildren. That's what it's about. It's not about winning small victories here and there. It's about the generations that are coming. So, uh, you know, I, I have really not a lot to add uh, to what has already been said in the fine addresses you've heard before me other than uh, we can't give up. And uh, those of us who are getting a bit long in the tooth, we're looking to, you know, who's going to take the fight forward, because it's a, it's a long fight. My uh, granddaughter Rosie here, who's from Tavioni, I don't want her to know a world without coral. I don't want to sp see her spending half her life putting out fires and digging up corpses from mudslides and uh, floods. And I don't want that kind of life for her, obviously. None of you want that life for your children or grandchildren. So that's why we're here to fight. And uh, we have uh, had our great leaders, and they will continue to be great leaders from the Pacific Islands to take that fight to the world. So thank you. I, and I add my uh, thanks to those of the young people that were here and before us. Naka. Our Pacific leaders have always been at the forefront of the climate fight, and we have always been able to stand on their shoulders because you are the giants who built this movement that we now get to, to be a part of, and we really wanted to, to honor that and show our appreciation for you all because we know that we wouldn't be able to stand here without the elders who paved the way for us, and, and it is an honor to be here. I think something that um, I always hold dear to my heart was actually a story told by the Ulu of Tokelau um, long ago about how the canoes in Tokelau are structured, that at the back of the canoe lies the uluhina, the, the gray-haired man or the gray-haired person, and they're the steerer of the canoe. They, they know the wisdom of the ocean. They know what the village has to do to be able to get into their canoe and sail the oceans. But within that middle of the canoe is the young people of the village, and they, they're the power, they're the passion, and they get our, our canoes going. But that canoe wouldn't be able to go anywhere without the guidance of our elders. And that's something we really want to honor here today. Uh, a couple of, of weeks ago, a few weeks ago, a group of young Pacific Islanders 
gathered online to talk about the climate crisis and COP26, and we put together a document, Youth for Pacific, Declaration on Climate, and the symbol of our declaration is the say or the, the, the flower. And so we brought some flowers here for you all today just to show that appreciation for our elders in the space and those who paved the way before us. And the girls will, would like to present a few of them to our front row. It's a really poignant moment to be permitted to come and be with you as your sister and your friend. Because the Commonwealth, which is made up of 54 countries, 2.6 billion people, 60% of whom are under the age of 30, have been in this fight for so long. Many of you may not remember when the Commonwealth came together in 1987. It was the first time that the Commonwealth led by the small island states, 25 island states in our Commonwealth, 32 small states, said that they feared that climate change would pose an existential threat. And the scientists from across our Commonwealth came together and informed our leaders. And can I just say thank you to our young people. Thank you for those young people who've acknowledged the wonderful leaders from the Pacific in this room and from the Commonwealth. Because in 1989, the Commonwealth leaders came together in Malaysia, in Langkawi, and they signed the Langkawi Declaration. And in that declaration, three years before the first COP, the scientists and the leaders of our Commonwealth, led by the Pacific, the Caribbean, and the Indian Ocean small states, said that if we did not address climate change, now, they said in 1989, we would face an existential threat. And I would invite all of us to reread that declaration, because if you are like me, it'll make you want to weep. Because everything that has happened in the last 30 years is outlined in that declaration. So when the Commonwealth came together in November, in Malta, in 2015, and said we needed 1.5 to stay alive, we didn't do it because it was a hope and aspiration. We did it because the empirical data demonstrated beyond paradventure that if we did not secure 1.5, many of our islands would not stay alive. And so this fight is a fight that the Pacific has always been in the lead on. But can I say that the Pacific has been joined by the Caribbean, by Africa, by Europe, by the Americas, and by Asia. Because in our Commonwealth, something very special happened when our 54 leaders sit around that table, the rich ones, with the poor ones, with the landlocked ones, with the island states, they do something quite extraordinary. They listen. But they don't just listen, they hear what is being said, and they feel it in their hearts. And can I just say to Peter, that as a grandfather, he thirsts for the future of his grandchildren. I am not yet a grandmother, but I too have aspirations in that regard. If my sons will do something about it. And we all want our children to have that future. So we all know why we are here. We all know what is at stake at this COP and why it is so important. And it's not just that solutions have to be forged, but they have to be maintained. They have to be shaped with the full legitimacy by those who are most affected by the impacts of climate change. What we've been talking about today is climate justice. Climate justice. 
because we have to be just to our oceans. Without that justice, there will be no future for any of us. And the Pacific is one of the most impacted regions in our Commonwealth. 10 million people who live on the Pacific Islands understand the daily challenge and the looming existential threat better than anyone. They taste it, they feel it, they experience it. And I have to tell you that nothing has pained me more than when I have spoken to young people who have been through a Category 5 hurricane or a cyclone. And they've seen their homes and their families destroyed. And they fear the sound of rain on their roofs. And I remember speaking to someone who, in the middle of a cyclone, had held tight to her son's hand. Three years old. She held so tightly because she was frightened that she would lose him. And he kept on crying, Mummy, you're holding me too tightly. And he pulled his hand from hers. And she never saw her son again. And every day for the last five years, she has gone round her village saying, has anyone seen my son? And so we are saying tonight, has anyone seen my son? And what we do and what we fail to do will determine whether our children will see another day. And so I want to say thank you to every leader present. Thank you for your courage. Thank you for your determination. Thank you for your willingness to be in this fight. Because in 20 years' time, when someone says to any of you, what did you do? We at least will be able to say, we tried. And I hope we will say, we succeeded. And that 1.5 to stay alive will be ours. So can I say, may God bless everyone in this room. May he give you the strength and the power of the seas. Because we have set sail that we in the Commonwealth are in one canoe. And we're paddling to save our lives. So thank you. And how our traditions, our culture, our identity is linked to the ocean. As a Norwegian, I can relate to that. And the ocean is also um, where many of our common challenges meet. If you are in the Pacific or up by the Arctic, where I'm from, like poverty, the ocean holds one of the main keys to ending hung hunger and poverty. And in terms of climate change, the ocean is both a victim and the solution. It holds the key to human health and to the health of our planet. Just like the Pacific states, Norway has lived by the sea and from the sea for centuries. We simply cannot survive without a healthy ocean. And half of the planet's oxygen is produced in the ocean. It absorbs a large share of the world's excess heat, moderating the Earth's temperature. And coastal habitats such as mangroves, coral reefs, help mit mitigate climate change. So the ocean is critical for managing the effects of climate change. Many Pacific states are here at the receiving end. I can assure you that Norway and our new government will continue our climate and international ocean policy and reinforce it. No. We aim to double our climate finance be before 2026 and to triple our contribution to climate adaptation. The ocean is the main source of protein for more than 3 billion people. And still, less than 5% of the world's food comes from the sea. 
We cannot battle hunger and malnutrition without unleashing the potential uh, of the ocean. But we also have to ask what we can do for the ocean. As Pacific states very well know, it is increasingly under threat. It's becoming warmer, more acidic, stormier, higher. And we have taken the, the, the ocean for granted, but no more. So is the ocean beyond repair? No, I say no. But we need to act, and we need to act now. Last year, the high-level panel for a sustainable ocean economy, chaired by Palau and Norway, launched an ambitious action agenda. And 15 countries are now represented in the panel, including Fiji and Palau. We have all committed ourselves to sustainably manage 100% 100 of the ocean area under our national jurisdiction by 2025. And this is to be guided by national sustainable ocean plans. All other coast and island states are encouraged to follow due by 2030. And these plans provide a critical pathway for meeting the sustainable development goals. And these plans, they balance out protection, production, prosperity, like they should. And these plans will be informed by sound knowledge, good practices, and profiting from our, com our common traditions as seafaring nations. Underpinning this, Norway is running capacity building programs benefiting vulnerable coast and island states. And together with you, Norway has been a proponent of a global agreement against marine litter and plastic pollution. And we would appreciate your continued support in the work ahead to establish, to establish such an agreement. I think it's encouraging to see uh, a new ocean mindset developing. Uh, we have seen an, emer uh, an unprecedented number of global initiatives, including the UN Ocean Conference, the UN Decade of Ocean Science, and the World Ocean Summit. And we see coastal nations advocating for equitable, sustainable growth. We see civil society and the youth highlighting the ocean's decline and vigorously endorsing action. And we see many businesses cleaning up their acts. This is all very inspiring. And this will lead us on our way to fulfilling the promise of the ocean and not least as well as we standing by our promise to the ocean. Thank you very much.